Let's take a look at page C4. We've looked at it previously. All right. First of all, what's the pre-embryonic phase? Remember, we divide embryonic development into pre-embryonic phase, embryonic phase, and fetal phase. The definition of pre-embryonic phase is the first three weeks. What happens during the first week of development? It's pictured right here. You go from a zygote to a blastocyst. And the blastocyst implants in the endometrial lining at the end of the first week. Uh, we saw on page uh, C5, we've done this all before, on C5, this is what the blastocyst looks like on the outside. It looks like a ball of cells. But when you make a cross-section through it, as shown at the top right on C5, it reveals that it's hollow in the inside. We know that the outer layer of cells called at this stage the trophoblast layer will become the outermost sac called the chorionic sac. There's a cluster of cells at one end, known as, at this stage as the inner cell mass. Some of these cells will become the amnionic sac. Some of the cells will become the actual baby and other structures. In the bottom picture, it shows, this is the bottom of C5, it shows uh, that uh, basically by the end of the first week, this blastocyst has implanted in the endometrial lining of the uterus. Incidentally, I've shown it implant here. It could have been planted here, could have been planted here, but it's implanted somewhere in the endometrial lining. We've learned that blood vessels are going to grow uh, profusely uh, in the area where the blastocyst is. There may be blast blood vessels throughout the endometrium, but they're going to become more numerous, uh, obviously, to nourish the uh, baby. And wherever those extra blood vessels are growing is called the decidua basalis of the endometrium. That's where these ma uh, maternal blood vessels are going to become very thick. Uh, on page uh, C7, this just shows uh, on C7, again, this blastocyst. Uh, here, it's already, this must be the second week because we're starting to see these chorionic villi grow. That starts to happen during the second week. Uh, the, uh, this is that inner cell mass, but the cells are already starting to change and specialize. Some are becoming the amnionic sac, some are becoming the yolk sac, some are becoming the umbilical cord. Uh, all of these still are considered uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, but what will become the baby is represented by that horizontal line. Remember, all of the cells that make up this entire blastocyst, which is very small, are uh, this, uh, and genetically the baby cells. They came from the zygote. On uh, page C8, on C8, so that what happens during the second week of development? There are two major things we've said. Uh, the uh, chorionic villi develop. And blood vessels will grow into the chorionic villi from the baby, and that forms what's called the fetal portion of the placenta. The fetal portion uh, is formed by the chorion frondosa of our chorionic villi. The maternal portion of the placenta is formed by the blood vessels growing profusely in this decidua basalis area of the endometrium of the uterus. Together, this allows nutrients and waste to be exchanged between the mother and the baby. Yep? So the placenta is the... Um, it's both. It's okay. this and this. Okay. It says it right here. The chorion frondosum and the decidua basalis. So it's one mass. When you deliver a baby, it's actually one mass that they deliver after the baby. Yeah, it's, it actually kind of tears away from the wall of the uterus. All right, the second major thing that uh, happens in the second week is that uh, layer of cells that will become the baby divides into three layers. Uh, an uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, a top, middle, and outer skin. <clears throat> and uh, we've been learning what each of these three germinal layers uh, will grow into. Uh, that takes us to C9. On page C9, so what happens during the third week of development? So during the third week of development, one of the most important things that happens is the formation of the neural tube uh, from ectoderm. Uh, uh, so that's going to become, that neural tube will become the central nervous system. What's the central nervous system? The brain and spinal cord. Now at the bottom of the page, those three germinal layers, ectoderm and mesoderm and endoderm, start to develop into these various 
things. Now, this is a dynamic process. It's, like, uh, uh, it's not like anything that finishes in one day. It's uh, progressing. So uh, the ectoderm is specializing in a surface ectoderm, which will become the epidermis. The neurotube or neuroectoderm will become the central nervous system. The mesoderm, also known as mesenchyme, will subdivide into three things, paraaxial mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, and lateral plate mesoderm. <clears throat> now, you were asking about lateral plate. The lateral plate mesoderm is going to further subdivide into somatic mesoderm and splanchnic mesoderm. But the endoderm is going to become the alimentary canal, which is also called the gut, which is also called the digestive system. The pictures that show this are on C10. So on C10, here we can see the, uh, the ectoderm in blue, and we can see this whole embryo folding into a tube shape, as we've learned. My uh, famous piece of paper here just folding into a tube. Right? And so uh, we have... This is the surface ectoderm, which will become the outer skin or epidermis. Here we can see the neural tube that developed from ectoderm, and that will become the whole brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system. The endoderm is easy. That becomes the alimentary canal or gut. Now, what about that mesoderm? So the, the first picture we had of the mesoderm here is here it's showing, labeled, that there is, this is the mesoderm. And it's dividing, it's specializing into three parts, paraaxial, intermediate, and lateral plate mesoderm. Now, I've only labeled it on the right, but it's also found on the left. Paraaxial, intermediate, and lateral plate. You say, well, well I, yeah, but I might think lateral plate's right here, not here. How would I know that? What does lateral mean? To the sides. So it's on the sides. Paraaxial means around the midline. So that, it's telling you what these words mean. Uh, uh, the words mean something, and intermediate is in between. Now, uh, the lateral plate mesoderm, I put a little star here, because by the time we look to this lower picture right here, I can still see the paraaxial. I can still see the intermediate. But what happened to the lateral plate? It's divided. The lateral plate was right here and right here. And now it's become two things somatic mesoderm, and splanchnic mesoderm. Now, a, the obvious question is, what, what are they? These are going to become membranes, the peritoneal membranes uh, in the abdomen and the pleural membranes in the chest. So this is the uh, a third week of development. So we follow this so far. Now, uh, uh, one more thing happens during the third week, and that's on C11, and this is important. It is important. The uh, hormone chorionic gonadotropin starts to be secreted from the chorionic villi into the mother's bloodstream. This hormone is what they test for on a pregnancy test. It's produced by you know, the outer sac around a baby. The only time a woman would have this hormone in her bloodstream, in her urine, is if there's a baby making it. What is it for? The purpose of this hormone, as we summarized last time, is that CG, chorionic gonadotropin, affects the ovaries of the mother. And what does it do to the ovaries of the mother? It causes the ovaries of the mother to secrete progesterone for the duration of the pregnancy. Well, what does progesterone do? Progesterone is a hormone uh, that produced by the ovaries that causes growth of blood vessels. And that's going to ensure, that's going to ensure that the blood vessels continue to <coughs> nourish the baby for the duration of the pregnancy. Now, let's consider what would happen if a woman didn't, let, let, what would happen if there wasn't uh, progesterone? Uh, then the blood vessels would actually be shed. And a woman would have, uh, when these blood vessels in the endometrium are shed, that's called having a period. So if a woman has a period or menstruates, sheds those blood vessels, she loses the pregnancy. All right? So this is what ensures that the pregnancy will be maintained. So it's kind of interesting that the, literally the ovaries of the mother are being controlled by a hormone produced by the baby. So her ovaries are, for the duration of the pregnancy, under the control of a hormone produced by the baby. 
that took us, any questions on that? Uh, now, so that's the third week. So you'll notice that in each case, I'm giving you maybe a few things to know about each of these critical weeks. There's a lot going on, but we've tried to keep it so it's a reasonable amount. Now, the embryonic phase is the fourth through eighth weeks. And I wrote that this is the most critical time. I explained last time that the, really the most critical time is the first three weeks, but in a sense, you don't have to worry about it. Because if anything goes wrong during the first three weeks, there's a spontaneous abortion. The baby just stops developing. One loses the pregnancy. But if something goes wrong in the fourth through eighth weeks, uh, the uh, baby will continue to develop but be born with serious deformities. Because this is the fourth through eighth weeks is when all the organs are really going to be forming. This is a critical time for all the organs. The fourth and fifth and sixth weeks are when, again, the nervous system is forming and the heart is uh, starting to form and beat and uh, the digestive tract and the uh, kidneys and uh, the whole skeletal system. and It's all happening during this time. Um, among the things that happen, uh, basically, we wrote uh, that the embryo is continuing to fold into a tube shape. Now, you'd say, well, didn't it do that in the third week? It started to do it in the third week, and it continues into the fourth and fifth week. So it's just continuing. Uh, on C12, we, here's a side cutaway view, a mid-sagittal section uh, through the uh, embryo. Here's the outer chorionic sac with the chorionic villi. Here's the inner amniotic sac. This is the baby right here. This is actually the neural tube, the brain and spinal cord. And uh, here's uh, the alimentary canal or gut forming and the yolk sac. Now you might say, this is really difficult. It's confusing. I understand. I'm not asking you to draw this picture on a blank sheet of paper. I'm just showing you one of the intermediate stages of what's happening. Uh, as the embryo is growing, the amniotic sac is expanding, and it eventually will expand until it fuses, it merges with the outer chorionic sac. Most of us had heard of an amniotic sac. We hadn't heard of a chorionic sac. But uh, that's because as the amniotic sac in increases in size, it m meets, it, m uh, it melds, it merges with, it fuses with the chorionic sac. But there are initially two sacs here. Uh, there's also a yolk sac. Uh, we, uh, we wrote below this, there's a constriction between the mid-gut and yolk sac. Okay, you'd say, I don't even know what that means. That's shown right here. It's constricting, it's separating. We're seeing a separation between the digestive tract and the yolk sac. You'd say, is that really important to know? No, it's not that important to know. All right, so uh, now, what I also wrote is happening during this fourth week is segmentation of the paraaxial mesoderm. I'm going to clarify that in just a moment. I'll clarify that in just a moment. Another thing that's happening in this fourth week and fifth week and sixth week is the area that's becoming the brain right here in the front is forming, it's dividing into three parts, a forebrain, a midbrain, and a hindbrain. You'd say, what do those words mean, fore, mid, hind? They mean front, middle, and back. And so different parts of our brain are forming. Obviously, this is a very critical time because something, if something goes wrong, it's going to impact the whole brain and how it's forming. Um, on page uh, C13, uh, C13 looked like this. We saw it last time. Again, I'm not asking you to draw it on a blank sheet of paper. In fact, I'm not even asking you to know this picture at all. Then you'd, you'd say, well, then let's skip it. But I do want you to know the pictures on page C16 and C17. But it's easier if I show you some of these intermediate stages to see how we got to the pictures on C16 and C17. Now, our first thought looking at C13, that's what we're looking at right here, Our first thought is, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Well, this is a, a continuation of what we saw on C10. This was page C10. Remember this? Here's C10. This is the third week. So what's happening in the fourth week? This is a cross-section. Everybody visualize that? There's a cross-section through the middle of the embryo. So let's just see. This was a 22-day-old embryo. So uh, on page C13, 
it, sh it shows also kind of a 22-day old embryo, approximately the same. All right, so what do we see? First, we see the outermost chorionic sac. We see the inner amnionic sac. This is a cross-section. Uh, here are the chorionic sac, down here are the chorionic villi. In this cross-sectional view, we see in blue the surface ectoderm becoming the outer skin, the epidermis. We see the neural tube becoming the spinal cord and brain. Uh, we see the endoderm folding into the digestive tract. The mesoderm is the most complicated. Of the, all the, th of the three parts of the mesoderm, paraaxial mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, and lateral plate, the most important is paraaxial. Paraaxial, what does that mean? Around the midline, it's right here. And it's divided into three parts. The paraaxial is divided into three things. The dermatome, right here, the viatome, and most in, in, inward, uh, is the sclerotome. The, and it's written right here. This is the paraaxial mesoderm. This is going to become, the dermatome will become the dermis of the skin. The myotome will become the muscles of the body. And the sclerotome will become the axial skeleton. What does sclero mean? Hard. Obviously, it's referring to your bones. So, and really, if you think about this, this is all pretty amazing. If, if you started just passing a, a, a scalpel deeper and deeper through the body, any place, you'd first go through the top epidermis, then through the dermis, then through the muscles, and then to the bones. Literally, that's the order in which they're, you, they, they're deeper and deeper. And this is how it's forming. It's pretty neat. That's how it forms. Now, uh, we did indicate also the intermediate mesoderm is labeled right here. It's also right here. So right here. These are the places of the intermediate. Uh, what is that going to become? We've learned that that's going to become the urogenital system. You'd say, you'd say, first of all, where did you tell us that? All of these, all of what all these things are becoming are summarized on the lower half of C19. The lower half of C19, you should try to know. That's a summary of how this whole thing uh, develops. Uh, it, it was also written on some other pages. I, and so you'd say, okay, fine, urogenital system. What does that even mean? It means the urinary system, like the kidneys, and genital is another way of saying reproductive system because the urinary and reproductive system develop from a common area. And as we've said before, in a guy, uh, what comes out the penis? You'd say, I don't know, urine from the urinary system or sperm from the reproductive system. All right, and then the, uh, as far as that lateral plate, the lateral plate mesoderm is already subdivided into somatic mesoderm and splanchnic mesoderm. And you might still be scratching your head saying, yeah, but I don't understand it. I'm going to explain it better. And then I've also said that if all the stuff, if that's the only thing you don't understand, you're going to do fine. All right? Make sure you understand everything else. But I will explain it more. Uh, we've also indicated that uh, at the bottom of C13 that the heart is, it starts beating during the fourth week. I did not explain how the heart forms. It develops from mesoderm. I didn't explain it. If we have time when we get to the circulatory system, I'll tell you more about how the heart forms. But uh, just know that it does start beating in the fourth week. The idea is to be impressed, at least I'm impressed, by how much fo is forming during the first few weeks of embryonic development. Because it's still extremely small, the embryo. Very small, but we already see that the ner nervous system is forming, the brain's forming, and the heart is already beating. Uh, on C14, C14, uh, we covered this last time. This is a mid-sagittal section. Uh, lengthwise of the embryo, and this is a cross-section. So again, here we can see the heart. It's beating already. This is that nervous system, the brain, developing eye, the spinal cord, and uh, here's the alimentary canal. Here's uh, still the yolk sac and all that. If we made a cross-section through the middle, it looks like the bottom picture. So you're thinking, well, wait, do we have to know these no, 
you do not need to know these pictures on either C13 or C14. I'm just trying to show you some stages. So again, we see the epidermis, the dermatome or der dermis, the myotome or muscles, the sclerotome. Notice the sclerotome, what's happening? It's, here it is, the sclerotome, it's growing around the spinal cord. That's going to form your vertebral column. Now, if this doesn't fuse entirely around the spinal cord, if it fails to totally encircle the spinal cord, the spinal cord will be sticking out of the vertebral column, and that's called spina bifida. Uh, now, uh, on page uh, C15, uh, there's some pictures, and, uh, and uh, you know what? Don't worry about these pictures, because we're going to show you something better than them anyhow. On uh, C60. Now, uh, let's actually let's start on C17. This picture I want you to know. You'd say why? Because I'm going to have this picture on your exam. How's that? This is going to be on the first exam. Yeah, I'm not asking you to draw it, but I want you to understand it. So there will be multiple choice questions about this picture. So you have to understand this enough. So I showed you some of those intermediate stages so you could see how we got to this. This is a 28-day-old embryo. You'd say, where does it say it? Right here. This is what a human baby looks like by the end of one month, four weeks, 28 days. And this looks somewhat similar to the picture we just saw a couple of pages ago. What do we notice? Here is that Neural tube developing into the brain. There's a forebrain, a midbrain, and a hindbrain. There's the eye developing off the forebrain. You'd say, where does it say forebrain? Right here. Where does it say midbrain? Right here. Where does it say hindbrain? Right there. I only point this out because sometimes people will say, where does it say? It's written right there. All right. The, uh, this is the heart, and it's already beating. Uh, this is the alimentary canal, which are all developed from endoderm. And not only will this become the alimentary canal or digestive tract, it's also going to develop into glands and, uh, it's going, and, and the liver and these other organs of the digestive tract and also the respiratory system. So where it says oral membrane, basically just follow that and that's the alimentary canal. What I've colored in yellow. All right, but the respiratory system also develops from the endoderm because it grows right off. Why don't you feel this? Put, feel, put your finger right here and feel your trachea. That grows right off your throat. Now, your throat was part of your alimentary canal. And this thing grows right off it. And what's, it, what's attached to your trachea? Your lungs. So that grew right off the throat. So it's made up of endoderm as well. Now, this is the umbilical cord right here. I circled it and circled it. And what's inside it is a collapsing yolk sac and a collapsing allantoic sac, but more importantly, umbilical blood vessels. Now, if we were to make, uh, and incidentally, right over here, of course, we see there's an inner amniotic sac and an outer chorionic sac. If we were to make a cross section right here, right there, we cut the embryo right in half. Now, our first thought is, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine ch ch cutting an embryo in half. Well, nowadays, we don't have to do, we don't have to cut an embryo in half. We don't have to cut you in half to know what's inside you in the middle of your body. That's what a computerized axial tomography does, or CAT scan. <coughs> a CT scan or an MRI creates series of images as if you would make cuts right through the middle of the body. Can we talk about that? Anybody watch those videos of uh, how the difference between a CT scan? And so if you've ever, anybody ever had a CT scan? All right, nobody? All right, so you're on a gurney, right? And they, the, the, it moves forward at intervals, and this thing's spinning, right? And it takes a whole bunch of pictures all around your entire body, and then you move forward even deeper, and it takes another series of pictures. Each time the thing creates a series of pictures, it creates this image as if you had made a cut right through the middle of your body. So you'll make a cut right here and then right below that and right below that as you're moving through that device. So uh, it's this idea of understanding what you look like, you know, through the middle of your head or the middle of your chest or the middle of your abdomen, uh, 
Nowadays, we don't have to go and actually cut somebody. We create an image. But you need to, and these images are very important. This is modern ways of taking scans of the body to see what we look like. So if we made, right, if we could take a whole series of images as if we had made series of cuts along the length of this embryo. But let's just look at this middle one. All right, so the middle one is page C16, which you also need to know for the test. So this is a cross-section right through the middle of the embryo. You'd say, does it say that? It says it right here. A cross or transverse section through the mid-gut region of the 28 day old embryo. Could, could they do it, an axial or a CT scan on a 28 day old? Yeah. They can? Yep, but they don't because that's x-rays, and x-rays cause genetic mutations. All right? So uh, that's the problem with you know, the CT is the radiation. All right? But they do it on adults, but they don't want to do it on an embryo. All right, so, uh, but they could. You asked, could they? They could. Uh, all right, so what do we see? So by uh, the end of uh, one month, we now have the surface ectoderm is, I no longer labeled it surface ectoderm. I've labeled it epidermis. Right underneath it, the dermis. That was the dermatome of the paraxial mesoderm. So those are the two layers of skin. Right below that, the muscles. That's what it says, skeletal muscle. You'd say, where did that come from? The myotome. And look at this. Here's the spinal cord. Here's a vertebra. Does that kind of look like a vertebra? All right, remember, spinous process, body of the vertebra, transverse process, the spinal cord's in the middle. You'd say, how did that happen? Remember how the sclerotome grew around it and fused. But if the sclerotome, the right and left parts of the sclerotome, had not fully formed around the spinal cord, the spinal cord would be sticking out of the vertebral column. And right here, we see something labeled a kidney. Here's a kidney. There's a kidney. Where did that come from? The intermediate mesoderm. That's where the intermediate mesoderm was on the picture's on the previous pages. Uh, now, the, uh, here's the alimentary canal, the gut, the intestine forming. And we see that there's a membrane wrapped right around the outer surface of this cross-section of the intestine. This membrane is called the visceral peritoneum. That actually developed from the splanchnic mesoderm. Splanchnic mesoderm became that. If you went back to the earlier pictures where it said splanchnic mesoderm, you will see it's labeled, it's right there. And it becomes now a membrane. And then, uh, what's this uh, membrane right here? This membrane on the inner wall of the abdomen, this is the inner wall, is, uh, is called the para uh, parietal peritoneum. Parietal means attached to the wall. Remember, I've opened my coat up many times and said that just like there's a lining on the inside of my coat, there's a membrane on the inside wall of your abdomen. That's the parietal peritoneum. It developed from the somatic mesoderm. If you went back in those earlier pictures and just traced the somatic mesoderm, that's what it became. This area between the somatic, uh, uh, between the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum, this area right in between is called the peritoneal cavity or coelom. We first used that term, peritoneal cavity or salome, originally on page A3. Page A3. All right, so uh, you should be familiar with these pictures. I think a question that was asked last time, so I'll just remind you, here I've also pointed to uh, what's labeled the aorta, and here it says it's pointing to an inferior vena cava. These are the major artery and vein of our body. I haven't talked about them, so I wouldn't ask you any questions on them, on the test. I didn't talk about them. I got enough to ask you questions on stuff I talked about. I'm not going to ask you questions on things I haven't even spoken about yet. So let's summarize how this embryo developed. Let's look on page C19. And in the lower half, which certainly looks less scary than the upper half. So here's how we summarized it. And hopefully, it's not as bad as it seems. The surface ectoderm became the epidermis of the skin. 
The neuroectoderm or neurotube became our nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. The mesoderm divided into paraxial mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, and lateral plate. The paraxial, which is the most important of these three, further subdivided into dermatome, myotome, and sclerotome. The dermatome became the dermis of the skin. The myotome became the skeletal muscles of the body. The sclerotome became the axial skeleton, which includes the vertebral column. The intermediate mesoderm develops into the urogenital system. Uro, like urinary, the kidneys, and genital, the reproductive system. And uh, the lateral plate mesoderm, the one that I feel is least important for you to know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn it, but least important, it subdivides the somatic mesoderm and splanchnic mesoderm. The somatic mesoderm becomes the parietal peritoneum. The splanchnic mesoderm becomes the visceral peritoneum. All right, and if you walk your way through it, you'll see it. The endoderm becomes the digestive tract. It also becomes the respiratory system, which grows right off it. Just feel your trachea, grew right off your throat, and the endocrine glands, such as your thyroid gland or pituitary gland, glands we'll be learning about. Now, on, the, on page uh, C18, we had already covered this. This was on C18. Uh, at the top, just reminding you about all these sacs. And I covered that earlier on. Can I ask a question on, yep. on the um, paraaxial, the somites? Yes, I'm gonna, that's what I was going to deal with right now. Okay. So, in fact, since we're on C18, you'll notice the fifth week is just a continuation of what's going on in the fourth. It's not like everything I just told you that happens in the fourth finished. It's still happening. And so you'll notice right here, it says paraxial mesoderm is becoming dermatome, myotome, and sclerotome, and they're becoming dermis, muscles, and axial skeleton. And I wrote the word somites. What is that? So I'll make a note, uh, C, C page C20. And on page C20, We've looked at this page before. We'll look at it right now. We're going to take a look at it. And uh, here's, uh, this is just showing stages of the embryo during the fifth and sixth and seventh week. Let's just look at this middle picture. This is a 35-day-old embryo. 35 days is the end of the fifth week. You'd say, how did you get that? Well, there's seven days in a week. Right? Day 14 would be the end of the second week. Day 21 would be the end of the third week. Right? Day 28 would be the end of the fourth week. Day 35, you just divide 7 into that number. And that tells you how many weeks. 7 into 14 is 2. 7 into 35 is 5. This is the end of the fifth week. All right? And you'll notice right here it says somites. Did everybody see that? Now, what are somites? That's the paraaxial mesoderm. That's the paraaxial mesoderm. It becomes segmented. It becomes divided into segments. It becomes segmented. So you'd say, I don't get that. Well, what's, it's dividing into little segments. You'd say, why? The paraxial mesoderm is going to become dermatome, the dermis, myotome, the muscles, and sclerotome, the skeleton, the axial skeleton. When we look at the skeleton, the axial skeleton, the vertebral column is all these separate vertebrae. Each, these, each segment, each somite, will become a separate vertebra. These are the future vertebrae. Not only is the sclerotome segmented and becoming the vertebrae, the myotome is segmented. Now you'd say, what? The muscles are segmented? Uh, here's a, a, a picture of the muscles. We're going to learn more about this. But uh, let me just, whether you look at the picture or not, let me remind you of something. Have you ever heard that some people who work out a lot, who don't have a lot of body fat on their tummy like I do, uh, they have this washboard tummy. They commonly call it a six-pack. You never notice how it's kind of ripples? It's like horizontal lines. Those are segments or somites of the muscles. The muscles are also segmented. Right? In this picture, you can kind of get a sense of it right here. Each of these was a separate somite.
The dermis of the skin is segmented, the muscles of the body are segmented, and the bones are segmented at a vertebrae. You follow that? So the, the only way that we could get the, you know, in other words, why isn't our vertebral column one solid bone around the spinal cord? Instead, it's a whole bunch of separate bones because the paraxial mesoderm became segmented. It doesn't use autolysis, does it? Huh? To divide them, does it use autolysis? You know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's becoming segmented, and that accounts for the vertebrae. It accounts for the segmentation of the muscles, the, this washboard stomach effect on the muscles that we'll talk more about. So just one so, more thing on the somite. I would have thought body cell, somatic. Well, somite, I mean. well, it's somite and not soma. Okay. So, but uh, anyhow, I didn't name these things, but that's that's what it is. All right. So uh, we actually first mentioned this term uh, somite. Uh, back on page uh, C12, on page C12, you'll see I said that there's segmentation during the fourth week on C12, segmentation of the paraxial mesoderm into 43 pairs of somites. I'm not going to test you on how many somites there are, but that's those somites, the, the paraxial mesoderm, which becomes segmented, becomes all these vertebrae and all these muscles. And, and so on. So that's why you've got multiple different muscles, not just one big muscle. You've got individual vertebrae, not just one big vertebral column, because it became segmented. So that's called somites. Anyhow, on uh, fifth week, the intermediate mesoderm is becoming the urogenital system, uh, lateral plate. And uh, the other important thing that happens during the fifth week is the forelimbs and hind limbs, the arms and legs start to develop. Don't worry about the last items on page uh, C18. Uh, don't worry about numbers three and four, but you should know that the arms and legs start to form. Let's take a look at that. On page C20, on C20, now there's really not much that you need to know about this page at all on C20. But let's spend a moment on it. So this shows a 30-day-old human baby. It says plus or minus one day, because it could be 29, could be 31. It's approximate. Here's its actual length. That's the actual length, what you've got. So it's pretty small. This is what it looks like. You'll notice here's the arms and legs starting to develop. Now, I might just point out that the front half of the body, the front half of the human body is growing and developing at a faster rate than the lower half. So the head is forming and developing, and the arms are forming and developing at a faster rate than the lower part of the body and the legs. So the arms are further along in forming than the legs are. That's what, the way it happens. Here we can see a 33-day-old embryo. You can see the actual size. Again, there's nothing in particular you need to know about these pictures at all. Uh, everybody notice that there are no fingers or toes, just a paddle-like hand or legs. And uh, here in the middle picture, the 35-day-old embryo, still just hands in uh, a paddle-like hand and foot. Again, notice how the arm is developing at a faster rate than the legs are. The head at this point makes up half the body. Half the entire embryo is head, about a third of it anyhow. Um, on the uh, lower, lower left, this is a 37-day-old embryo. Notice the fingers are starting to form and the toes through programmed cell death or autolysis. And then here's a 42-day-old embryo. <clears throat> That's the end of the sixth week. You'd say, how do you get that? Seven days in a week, seven goes into 42 six times. That's the end of the sixth week. So notice we've got an eye, eye forming, uh, the uh, ear, the fingers and toes, but the whole front end is growing at a faster rate. If we look on page C21, on C21, uh, this is an actual, I reproduced an actual photograph taken in the womb of a human baby. Uh, they have, uh, there's a, a famous Swedish photographer named Leonard Nielsen who actually obviously got permission from women to actually insert a fiber optic camera into their womb 
uh, and actually photograph different stages of the embryo during actual development. So this is the baby, it's about half head, here's the umbilical cord, inside it are the blood vessels, and this is connected to the chorionic sac. It looks very much like the picture we saw on the previous page. Now, we had said that as the embryo uh, forms and it folds into a tube shape, so this tube is going to fuse together on the bottom, on the ventral side. Right here on the ventral, the belly side, is where these two parts of the tube join together. That means it's right along the midline right here. The very last place where this tube joined together was your belly button. That's the very last place where it joined together, and it never really fully joined. That's why there's no muscle. I, did we talk about this before? No. If you stick your finger in your belly button, go ahead. If you stick your finger in the belly button, if you put, all there is is skin, and if you push hard enough, you'll, your, your finger will pop right into the abdominal cavity. There's no muscle at the, under, in the belly button. There's muscle to the sides of it. There's muscle below it, there's muscle above it. There's no muscle underneath the skin there. So it never really totally fused all together. Uh, now, because of the way this tube is fusing, right, as it folds into a tube, it's fusing right along the med ventral midline, these are the most common places for deformities or defects. So that's, and here, right along the midline, the right and left mandible are fusing together, the right and left maxilla are fusing together. If they don't fuse together properly, you get cleft lips and cleft palates, which are right along the midline. And so this is where we tend to see a number of common problems. They're not over, usually they're not really serious problems, but they do tend to occur right along the ventral midline. Uh, so that's how it's forming. Here uh, is, uh, this is, uh, this picture here is a 48-day-old embryo. 49 would be the end of the seventh uh, week. And uh, it's starting to look pretty human by this time. Notice, again, how the front half of the body has matured faster than the lower half. The fingers are already formed here, but the toes are still formed. Now, on uh, page C22, what happens during the eighth week? Now, you'd say, well, you weren't very clear as far as what happened during the fifth and sixth and seventh. Uh, basically, what's happening during those fifth and sixth and seventh weeks is a continuation of what started out in the fourth, third and fourth week. By the eighth week, we're just going to identify a few more important things. By the eighth week, the eyes and ears and nose are forming. The head makes up about half the embryo. And there are digits. There are fingers and toes on the hands and feet. I do want you to also know that the bones begin to calcify. Interestingly, what will become the bones initially start out made up of, made up of cartilage. And then they start to calcify and turn into bones beginning with the eighth week. For those of you interested in dentistry or dental hygiene, the baby teeth are already forming during the eighth week inside the gums. Is anybody here? I forgot. Does anybody understand that? So the, the baby teeth are already forming. Those baby teeth aren't going to erupt or come out until six months after birth, but they are already forming in the gums, in the embryo. Yes? Well, it doesn't, they, whatever, however old it is, it didn't change whether it was inside or outside. So why do we call it, why do we wait a year after with developing or just say the baby's one instead of saying it's Because some people say that. Well, because that, that, cause that birthday, it, what does birthday or birth date mean? It's the anniversary of the day they were born. It's not an indication of exactly how long they were in the womb or not in the womb. You're celebrating. Right? It's an annual celebration of the date that they were born on. They could have been born premature. They could have been born late. You're just celebrating the day, remembering the day they were born. Well, the concept is we're nine months older than we really are. That's what some people say. Right. 
All right, but, we're not, Korea, we, but I'm just talking about the birth date has yeah, nothing to do with that. In Korea, their birth date actually falls on taking into consideration the nine months. Okay. Yeah, it's different. All right, the, uh, now, uh, the fetal phase, right? So what's the fetal phase? The pre-embryonic phase was the first three weeks. The embryonic phase was the fourth through the eighth week. So the fetal phase begins with the ninth week until birth. Now, it, so we start to use this term fetus beginning with the ninth week. And you should know that. You need to know that. Now, it's really biologically all one continuous process. But once it reaches nine weeks, there is legal significance. Now, I'm not, into, we're not, te I'm not teaching the law. I'm not teaching uh, political science. But various procedures and so on that can be done to an embryo can't be done to an, a fetus. So there are various legal issues that start to kick in. It has nothing to do with the biological, but it has to do with legal. Uh, the, or, the word fetus means young one. In other words, by a nine time, the uh, embryo is nine weeks old. It does look human. Earlier, during the third and fourth and fifth week, uh, the way a human embryo looks, it could have been a chicken embryo, it could have been a dog embryo, it could have been a monkey embryo. But by the time it reaches nine weeks, it's, it clearly looks human. It doesn't even look like a monkey by that time. So. But uh, earlier on, it could have been an embryo of a lot of different animals. Uh, now, the uh, way that uh, we indicated that uh, at nine weeks, it's about two inches long from CR. CR means crown to rump. Crown, head, rump, butt. I'm not asking you to remember that length. I'm not. But uh, is anybody in this class going into ultrasound, sonography? All right, so one of the things that radiology techs, certain radiology techs do, is they do ultrasounds of women who are pregnant. And nowadays, any woman who goes to an OBGYN is going to have an ultrasound done. And they will look at, under ultrasound, the image, and they will measure how big the embryo is at different stages. They want to see if it's growing normally. Now, the baby is in the fetal position. They can't see its legs, because its, its the legs are tucked up under its tummy, kind of how all of us want to get back into our fetal position. So they can only measure it from head to butt, or crown to rump. So that's how they measure it in the womb with ultrasound. It weighs about a half an ounce. Again, I'm not asking you to know the numbers. I'm just explaining how it's done. By the time the baby is born, at the end of nine months, uh, it's 14 inches from crown to rump. I'm not asking you to know that number. But some of you are thinking, wait a second, 14 inches? I, I, I had a baby. I, know, uh, I had a little nephew or niece born. They were 22 inches long. After a baby's born, they measure it from head to toe. They stretch it out and they measure how long the baby is from the top of its head to the bottom of its feet. In the womb, you can't do that. So they still can only measure it from crown to rump, head to butt, and it's 14 inches from crown to rump. Uh, I wrote that the baby at nine months, uh, full term, weighs about seven and a quarter pounds. That's what it used to be. Now with better nutrition, most babies are closer to almost eight pounds today, seven and three quarters. So they weigh, babies weigh more than they used to. They're getting bigger and bigger kind of with each generation, presumably because of uh, nutrition. Now, uh, during the third month, you'd say, well, aren't we going to say anything more about uh, the uh, ninth week or something? No. Third month, uh, on the ultrasound, you might be able to tell whether it's a male or female because you might see a penis on the ultrasound by the uh, third month. Um, the eyelids are formed and they're closed. And what starts to grow all over the b body of the baby during the third month is like a peach fuzz, a very fine hair called lanugo, called lanugo. And uh, when a baby is born, it is born with this kind of peach fuzz, this fine hair all over its face, all over its body. Is that right? Anybody seen that? Yeah. All right, now it falls off within a few days. Okay, you don't even notice, it just falls off. But it is born with this kind of fuzzy hair all over its body, including its face. The nails start to develop, and by the time a baby is born, it needs its nails cut. It's always scary to cut little newborn babies, uh, infants' uh, nails, because they have such tiny little fingers, you're always worried that if you snip in the wrong place, you'll cut half their finger off. But you do have to cut the nails because they're sharp, and the baby can scratch itself 
with these sharp nails, so you have to cut them. Uh, the permanent teeth start to develop. So this is during the third month of embryonic development. Not only are the baby teeth forming in the gums, right underneath them, the permanent teeth are forming. So if somebody is born with deformed teeth, that occurred during embryonic development. Now the permanent teeth aren't going to erupt or come out until six years after birth. But nevertheless, they're still forming. This also indicates why women who are pregnant, they want them to take extra calcium because they have to provide the additional calcium for the calcifying bones and the forming of the teeth. And not a deficiency of calcium in the mother might mean that the bones and teeth are deformed and don't have enough calcium mineral in them. Uh, the uh, kidneys are already working now, and the baby pees or urinates right into the amniotic sac. Now, the urine is very dilute. It's not like uh, the baby's not eating food. It's getting its nourishment across the placenta from the mother in the form of sugars and amino acids and, uh, and, uh, and so on. It's not eating steak. So uh, the, the, there are really very little wastes that are in the uh, urine, but the baby is urinating. By the uh, fourth month, the mandible is formed. I don't think that's so important. By the fifth month, the baby is big enough so the mother can feel the movement of the baby within her womb. That's called quickening. Another thing, weird thing has, starts to happen in the fifth month. The skin starts to secrete a gooey white stuff called vernix caseosa. It literally, caseosa means cheese. It's like a white pasty cheese stuff is secreted by the skin everywhere. A baby is born covered with this gooey white stuff. Has anybody ever seen that? One of the first things the nurse does before they hand the baby to the mother is they have a towel and they're wiping all this gooey white stuff off their skin. Now what is it? What's all that gooey white stuff? If you've ever sat in a bathtub for a long time, you notice how your skin gets all puffy? Well imagine being immersed in a salty fluid, saline fluid, amniotic fluid for nine months. So to protect the skin, from the, being immersed, surrounded by this saline, this salty amniotic fluid for nine months, it secretes this kind of gooey, it's almost like skin lotion, to protect the skin from being immersed in this salty fluid for nine months. Uh, by the fifth month, hair is growing on the top of the baby's head, and most babies are born with a full head of hair. And then it falls out uh, after they're born. By the sixth month, they have uh, eyebrows and eyelashes, and what, something very important I want you to know, very important on the sixth month. The pulmonary alveoli begin to develop. You'd say, what are those? Those are the air sacs. The lungs are the last organ to become functional in an embryo, in a fetus. The last organ to become functional are the lungs. They only start to form these little microscopic air sacs called alveoli, pulmonary alveoli, pulmonary means in the lungs, in the sixth month. That means that if a baby is born premature, the most common complication of a premature birth are breathing problems because the lungs are not yet functional. That's the biggest problem when they're born premature. They have a, a vaccine for it. Or for. It's pretty expensive. They can uh, basically uh, introduce what's known as pulmonary surfactant into the lungs to try to help ease the breathing. But they still don't have sacs yet. No. So that's usually a breathing problem. By the seventh month, the uh, fetus, baby, rotates into the cephalic presentation. You'd say, what does that mean? Most uh, women carry the baby. The baby is oriented horizontally. Around the seventh month, the baby starts to rotate into the head down position. That's called cephalic presentation. Cephalic means head. That means when the baby is born, the head comes out first. We're going to see a picture on R24 of that in a moment. Now, uh, the mother may feel the baby hiccup. And what happens by the seventh month, the, the fetus is uh, usually got enough air sacs, so there's no problem surviving. It's just really scrawny. <laughs> because what happens during the last two months, the eighth and ninth months, is the baby gets chubby. 
So if it goes full term, it's born kind of chubby. If it's born earlier than that, it's, it's like skin and bones. It's very scrawny. It doesn't have fat. So that's really what it does is it gains, starts to gain subcutaneous fat beginning in the seventh and especially in the eighth and ninth months. On uh, page C23, by the uh, eighth month, the uh, fetus is very active. The mother's getting real strong kicks and even more so in the ninth month. And very interestingly, and something you should know, during the ninth month of development, the testes in a boy baby descend into the scrotum. So you'd say, what does that mean? The testes develop, initially form, in the pelvis, exactly where the ovaries form and remain in a, in a female. The ovaries are in the pelvis, the testes form in the pelvis. In the ninth month, the testes start to move, and they migrate down into the scrotum, the scrotal sacs. Those are the sacs below the penis. One of the things the pediatrician is going to do if it's a boy baby is they're going to feel the scrotum to see if this, uh, the testes have fully descended. If the testes are not fully descended after a few weeks after birth, they will do surgery to bring those testes down because failure of the testes to fully descend into the scrotal sacs underneath the penis could result in sterility later in life because the testes can only produce sperm if they're in the scrotal sacs. So they want to make sure that they fully descend it, or they'll do surgery. Surgery by what, six weeks? Or... Uh, I don't know the exact week. It depends on how far they've descended. Uh, now, uh, the 10th month. Now, obviously, during the 10th month, the, ma the baby, presumably, has been born. But some babies don't want to come out. They're late. So whether they are still inside the womb or whether they've already been born, we still know that things are happening. The testes are fully descended, the nails need uh, cutting, and that fine peach fuzz, lunugo hair, is falling off okay, by the 10th uh, month. So just because the baby has been born doesn't mean that it's finished growing. Okay? It's just a little infant. Well, the only reason we said why a baby is born at this point is because it's getting too big to keep growing any further inside the mother. It's going to have to do the rest of its growing outside the mother. Now, you'll notice in these pictures, it shows the relative proportions of the baby. At a two-month two -month old fetus, it's half head. At a newborn, it's about a fourth head. And as you get older, two years, five years, 13, 22, your head's getting smaller and smaller until it disappears. Well, it's not that the head gets smaller. It's that the head actually doesn't change much. It's the rest of the body that gets bigger. So the head, the, so the head makes up a smaller proportion of the entire body because the rest of the body is growing. The head was, doesn't change much from the time of birth. Uh, we've already looked at C24. On C24, uh, there's nothing in particular you have to know on this, but this is a nice little summary just showing you how the baby develops kind of week by week and how it's changing. And we saw with the bar graph in black, these are the most critical times for the development of the nervous system and the heart and the arms and the eyes and the legs. And you'll notice most of the most critical time is this fourth and fifth and sixth weeks. That's really when all these organs are first forming. All right, so um, in terms of uh, multiple births, obviously, usually a woman gives birth to one baby at a time. That's that the vast majority of women have one birth baby at a time. Just as a side note, I don't know if I mentioned this before, I can't remember, uh, you can actually figure out pretty easily how many babies uh, any species of mammals gives birth to at a time by counting the number of pairs of nipples. I don't know if I'd mentioned that before. Yeah. So humans have one pair of nipples, right? They normally give birth to one baby at a time, so the baby can nurse on the right and then on the left or vice versa, but they've got, uh, and, and so uh, if you look at uh, dogs or cats, all you have to do is count the number of pairs of nipples. If the dog or cat has five pairs of nipples, they usually give birth to five babies, puppies, or kitties at a time. So you just count the number of pairs. There's obviously always exceptions, but that's usually the pattern of how it works. So um, 
Now, occasionally, a woman does give birth to uh, more than one baby at once. And uh, if it's two, that's called twins. The probability of twins is approximately 10 out of 1,000, which we could simplify as one out of 100. So about one uh, 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 birth out of 100 are twins. Uh, the majority of these, two-thirds, are fraternal. One-third are identical. What's the difference? We'll get to that in a moment. There are ethnic differences. There are ethnic differences indicating there are genetic differences. This is primarily related to fraternal twins. Uh, you'll notice that the probability of individuals in Japan or of Japanese ancestry having twins is just two out of a thousand, whereas the probability of somebody for, who lives in Nigeria or of Nigerian ancestry is 40 out of a thousand. So it's much, much higher. Uh, uh, there, the, again, the, there's some genetic differences that it manifest itself, obviously, ethnically. We're going to tell you a little bit more about that, why that is in a moment. Uh, the uh, triplets, what's the probability of having three babies at once? Well, well uh, if uh, twins was one out of 100, and I'm, I'm not asking you to memorize, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, how, what's the probability of twins or triplets, but the probability of triplets is uh, less than one out of 10,000, one out of 10,000. The probability of having quads, four, is almost one out of a million. Almost one out of a million. Anything more than that would never, ever, ever happen naturally. So the idea of having five babies, eight babies, would never happen naturally. I mean, so you'd say, well, then what about Octomom? Yeah, I'd say, what about Octomom? Octomom, anybody who has more than four, it's medical intervention. They're either taking fertility drugs, or they've had in vitro fertilization, or they've implanted uh, multiple eggs or fertilized eggs, which is the case of Octomom. Uh, so it would never, ever happen naturally. The human body isn't designed to have, give birth to that many. Let's talk about the difference between fraternal and identical twins. The technical name for fraternal twins is dizygotic, meaning two zygotes. Uh, or uh, fraternal triplets would be trizygotic. Uh, how does this work? So uh, basically, some women will ovulate or release more than one egg in a month. Now, normally, a woman uh, releases one egg uh, uh, each month, each cycle. Uh, we assume that the ovaries alternate, that if one month or one cycle uh, the egg pops out of a right ovary. The next month, the next cycle, the egg pops out of the left ovary. But is it possible that a woman might ovulate an egg from both ovaries at the same time? It's possible. And this tendency, incidentally, to ovulate more than one egg each month is genetic. Uh, so uh, that's why these slight ethnic differences of this tendency to release more than one egg. Uh, so if a woman ovulates, let's say, two eggs, and she has intercourse, and during intercourse, of course, a guy introduced millions of sperms. So one sperm unites with this egg, a different sperm unites with another egg, each one results in a different baby. These babies are no more alike than brothers or sisters. One might be a boy baby, one might be a girl baby. Even if they're both boys, they're no more alike than just brothers, all right, uh, or sisters. Uh, so this is uh, fraternal twins or dizygotic because they're two separate zygotes. All right, now what are uh, monozygotic twins? Identical twins are monozygotic. This is really, quote, a freak of nature. We don't know why this happens. We don't know why this happens, but it occasionally happens. It's much less common than uh, dizygotic twins. Uh, this, we know, here's the uh, uh, zygote. It divides into a two-celled embryo. We know that it becomes four-celled, eight-celled, 16, 32, 64, forms a little ball of cells called a morula, and then it becomes a hollowed-out ball called a blastocyst. Remember that? This is the blastocyst. Now, we know that uh, in a cutaway view of a blastocyst, we know the outer parts, the future chorionic sac, and this is the inner cell mass. For some reason, we don't know why, sometimes the inner cell mass splits into two parts. Now remember, all the cells in the blastocyst are genetically the same. They all developed from the zygote. These are all genetically the same as the baby cells. So if this is an inner cell mass and this is an inner cell mass, then some of these cells here will become a baby and some of these cells here will become a baby. So what we're seeing 
is two babies developing inside the same chorionic sac. They are absolutely genetically identical. So what we've got here are two babies that develop inside the same chorionic sac. They are absolutely genetically identical. That's called monozygotic twins. They develop from the very same uh, uh, embryo, right? So uh, now, interestingly, sometimes, sometimes, I'll try to show it here, the uh, inner cell mass cells are still slightly connected together. All right, so the inner cell mass cells, some of them may still be bridged together. If they are, that means that when these become, develop into two babies, the two babies are joined together. That's called conjoined twins, an older name was Siamese twins. They are identical, they are genetically identical, and they are joined together. You probably remember hearing, possibly, just a, about two or three weeks ago, there was a pair of conjoined twins joined at the head that they successfully separated. 